M-I-P With Masamela Matsuma Mark Thompson Make it kind Get woke Ladies and gentlemen, of course you've heard me say how much regard I have for PRISM, PRISMreports.org uh, and we want to do more with PRISM as they are representing uh, a brand of journalism that we all would do well to hear more from, to hear more representation um, from black and indigenous and other people of color, and particularly from women journalists uh, as well. Uh, we need to broaden our horizons. So I hope you all will join me in welcoming the editor in chief of PRISM, Ashton. Lattimore. Ashton, how are you? And welcome to Make It Plain. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be joining you today. And it's a pleasure to have you. Now, I wanted you on, but now that I realize what we're going to talk about, this may not be good because it's going to enable me. I'm, I have a real problem. I don't know anybody last summer in the reckoning who marched for a national holiday. Mm. I remember a march for that. <laughs> I've gone around the country. I've asked people, raise your hand if you knew anybody who marched for that. Now, don't get me wrong. It's nice. Don't have a problem with that. But, you know, Frederick Douglass said, what to the slaves the 4th of July? He talked, he wrote about, there was all, Christmas was always a holiday that all the enslaved people got. Yep. But it was illusory in the sense that you don't have no holiday, no real holiday when you enslaved. No. And we've got almost 200 co-sponsors for HR 40. They scared to vote for that. And they think they can buy, see, you already got me going. I don't even ask you a question yet. <laughs> <laughs> so this is probably already just a bad idea. You've enabled my behavior, but it let, let me. <laughs> but but let let me let me throw it uh, to you. You've written a piece. Juneteenth highlights the gap between rhetoric and reality about who's actually free in America. It, it really is. I mean, everybody voted for it, mm-hmm. and those same people don't want critical race theory. They're afraid to bring. And, and these are Republicans. Then you got Democrats who say, Mark. Reparations like defund. We can't do that. The midterms, midterms are a year and a half away. Shut up and bring the bill to the floor. So, mm-hmm. so, so, let, let, talk to us about what you found in in dealing and writing with your piece and how it really does. The holiday is nice, but it really does ring hollow when it comes to the reality. I mean, it's exactly what you described. Nobody last summer, I don't think too many folks in, in the last, you know, 50, 60, 100 years have been out marching for a Juneteenth holiday. You know, it's certainly been a demand that's come up in a few different circles and, you know, not to dishonor the folks who, who have pushed for it, but has that been the broader call for what Black people are looking for in America? Absolutely not. And because a holiday is is words. A holiday is a symbol. What we're talking about here is enforcement. That's what we're looking for. So, you know, people are in the streets, you know, defund the police, abolish the police. We're in the courts trying to enforce the Voting Rights Act. We're, we're trying to get the rights that we have uh, able to actually be exercised. And, uh, you know, Congress unanimously giving us a holiday that a few folks may have asked for and, you know, happy to have another day off from work uh, doesn't move us any further in the direction of actual lived freedom. And it also kind of hints, I, I was doing a show when it happened, um, where the night it was signed in law, and also kind of hints as to how much it, it wasn't. And you're right. There are some people who fought for it. I get that. That's fine. But see, I remember, you probably too young to remember this, uh, Martin Luther King holiday. Mm-hmm. And that was a bitter fight, not only at the federal level, but state to state. Yep. That was something that we had to struggle for and really earn because of the fight. Then you just pop up and give us a holiday. It makes me think, well, what are you really trying to do here? What Are you mm-hmm. Are you trying to fool us? Because the last holiday we really wanted, y'all didn't want us to have. Yep. So, I mean, they, are we on holiday time now? Because I'm, I'm saying, hey, let's make Harry Tubman's birthday a national holiday. Let's make... Now, Let's do it. Since we rolling, <laughs> that's what we're doing now. I got a whole list of holidays, right? Yeah. It feels very much like a distraction. It's very much watch what my mouth is saying. Don't look at what my left hand is doing over here to your voting rights. Don't look at what my left hand is doing over here to criminal justice. Just here, here, have this, have this and be excited. And, you know, it's just in time for, for kind of the anniversary period of the, the reckoning that started last year. And, 
I'm I'm suspicious, frankly, of anything that can win that kind of unanimous support in this environment. Uh, something about that rings worse than hollow to me. Uh, it rings a little suspicious um, in terms of of the motives that are animating it. And I think the sense that now that we've given you this, could you perhaps just be quiet and go away while we try to, you know, legislate all these other things. And you're a great writer too. Folks, you, you gotta read the piece because what she's done, there are, are layers of the lack of reality in this. So when you, when you take apart the layer one, let's just deal with Juneteenth itself. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, this Juneteenth is the story of the enslaved ancestors in in, Gal in Texas, particularly Galveston, mm -hmm. who for whom the news arrived late in the first place. So, so then there's the layer of wait a minute. If the Emancipation Proclamation was months before, mm -hmm. or years before, I should say, yeah. was it really? Was that really real? Mm -hmm. If everybody didn't know about it and it wasn't enforced. Yeah. I mean, you know, if a, if a tree falls in the woods and, and nobody hears it, did it make a sound? If you set some slaves free and don't tell them and, and worse than that, because Juneteenth is also a story about enforcement. The word arrived with the troops to enforce right. the proclamation. If you don't just bring the word, if you have you have to bring the people who are able to put that word into practice, to put that word into enforcement. Otherwise, you know, it's going to ring hollow whether the people have heard it or not. So y'all see what she did? You saw see what she did right there? You see that? So mm -hmm. so so watch this. If you're going to do it again. Mm -hmm. 100 years later, 150 some odd years later, without the enforcement. So, I mean, what are you doing? You, you're basically doing the, the same thing. It was, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it was hollow then without enforcement. It's hollow today without enforcement of, of all the rights we're demanding right now, right? That's exactly right. And I think enforcement is so much on my mind today because of the voting rights case that just came down in the Supreme Court. Because, yes, we have the the 15th amendment that says that you can't be denied the right to vote on the basis of race we have the voting rights act sort of that says you know the states can't can't input these things to, to deny folks the right to vote uh, for racial reasons or, or other discriminatory reasons but when the mechanism of enforcement is not there or it's no longer operational or has been weakened what you have is paper and paper is not going to get anybody to the ballot box. Paper is not going to elect anyone. There need to be enforcement mechanisms. And that's exactly what the Supreme Court has been steadily gutting over these last few years. Right. More MIP after this message. One of the things I criticize the Democrats for, I mean, you create a Juneteenth bill mm -hmm. that Republicans vote for. And what, but what you really done is see it's, it to me, it's not worth that political capital. To be able to say you have a Juneteenth holiday, when really what it does, it enables the Republicans to say, we did something. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, that's really all it is. Of course, Democrats are going to vote for Juneteenth. That's not, not we're not going to go reelect Democrats as black folk in 2022 because they voted for Juneteenth. Mm -hmm. that, that, you know, if, if you want black, if you want your constituency, and let's be honest, the Democratic Party's base constituency is African-Americans, particularly right. black women. That's right. You got to put some, you got to do something with some teeth. Mm -hmm. But but yeah. all you've done is give Republicans to lie and run on something, you know, and, and do the fork tongue thing they do. Well, we voted for this, but we don't want Nicole Hannah Jones. We don't want critical race theory. We yeah. don't want anything else. I mean, it, you do that, then you let Joe Manchin get away with whatever he's doing. That's so exactly it, So at the end of the day, uh, doesn't it, Ashton, it's, 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 it's hollow, but it's also, in, in a certain way, really... Uh, um, and this is probably too too uh, uh, soft of a tone. It's a serious political miscalculation because you're mm -hmm. giving the other party, your enemy, something to stand on that isn't really real. That's exactly what, what's happening. And I think that's how so much of the Republican Party operates. There's always some symbolic thing that they can point to to say, you know, we're not racist because X, Y, Z. We're not racist because, hey, we, we gave you Juneteenth. We said Juneteenth is okay. We're not racist because we now say, you know, maybe what they were saying 30 years ago is different. We now say Martin Luther King is, is great and he's our favorite guy. We're saying all the right things. Listen to what we're saying. Don't watch what our hands are doing, you know, right. in the legislatures, the state level and in Congress. So I think anything politically that's done to hand them another symbol to run on. And let's be clear, they're not running on these symbols for the purposes of winning black votes. They're running on these symbols in order to make 
white voters feel like it's okay to vote for them. They're not racist. I'm not racist if I vote for them because look here what they did. And now they have, you know, now there's one more thing that they can point to, to, to kind of um, launder basically the, the rest of their conduct. What our sister Ashton does in her piece is chronicle the history after emancipation. Uh, we were left at the mercy of segregation of state governments, lynchings, the, the lag between the 15th and 19th amendments, she writes, extension of voting rights to black people on paper, the Voting Rights Act, all of this. And so today, you, you, you bring that up to today, mm -hmm. people languishing in prison yeah. for the ridiculous offense, offenses having to do with weed. I mean, you, you still have all these things happening. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, really, uh, it's really the same thing. It's really history repeating itself just like it did during Juneteenth and emancipation. Mm -hmm. And it's so interesting that they would go back to the same place. We're just going to do this, mm -hmm. make this announcement, make this proclamation. Mm -hmm. But we're also going to repeat the history of yep. not giving, you know, African American. We have lynchings today. Yes. These are the police violence. That is modern day lynchings in my view. Absolutely it is. And I think with the increased public attention to them, they're serving much the same function that lynchings did. Lynchings were public activities intentionally because they're not just meant to harm the person who's actually being lynched. They're a message to the rest of the community in much the same way that a lot of these police killings, a lot of the ways the police have responded to protesters who are speaking out against these killings, they're not just for those, those moments and those people, they're a show of force intended to intimidate the rest of us so that the history is cyclical with all of these things and that's kind of you know the way american history works and you know you might make an argument that's the way world history works but but that's the pattern here you you make a statement and then don't put in place the enforcement mechanisms to back it up folks uh, please uh, check out this powerful piece juneteenth highlights the gap between rhetoric and reality about who's actually uh, free in america uh, the editor-in-chief of, uh, of, of PRISM here with us. Now, I'd like to give you an opportunity to tell our audience a little bit more from your perspective about what, what PRISM is really all about, what you all are trying to do, what you, what you want PRISM to present, what you want it to be to the audience that reads it. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for that opportunity. So PRISM is an independent nonprofit news outlet, um, you know, by and for our communities of color. So what we do is we focus our coverage on social justice issues. So we're heavy into criminal justice, gender justice. Uh, we're expanding into climate justice. Uh, racial justice is kind of the animating thread that ties it all together. Uh, and what we really aim to do with our coverage is provide information, provide context, provide what readers need to empower themselves, to empower their communities, to solve some of the most pressing problems that we're facing um, in the United States today. You know, like police violence, like the assault on, on reproductive rights, uh, like the, the growing climate crisis. So, so we're here, you know, reporting on all of those things from the perspective of, of people of color. And, uh, you know, our, our newsroom is all women of color. So, so you'd be you know, supporting women journalists, supporting journalists of color. So, so you know, check us out, prismreports.org and, and, you know, follow us on, on Twitter Instagram and, and on Facebook. More MIP after this message. So let me ask you this. How, how do you feel about how you guys are doing? Do you feel like your message is getting out there? Do you feel like it's it's gaining support? Because, I mean, we, especially Black folk, we are so targeted for misinformation mm -hmm. these days. Yes. Um, yeah. And so that's why I think what you're doing is important. But I know uh, the challenge in cutting through the misinformation and what the mainstream is doing. But how are you feeling? You feel like you guys are, are, are making some inroads and, and growing? We do. We do feel like we're making some inroads. You know, as difficult as this last year has been, you know, we launched basically in a pandemic, we launched in a, in a racial reckoning. Uh, we also came into a moment, I think, in communities of color where people are ready for the kinds of stories that we're telling and people are hungry for them. So I think we have increasingly been finding, you know, communities of readers, communities of other folks, you know, who are in our network who appreciate the kind of reporting that we're doing um, and appreciate that we're coming at this work with conviction. We're not doing both sides reporting where, you know, the Democrats are just as bad as the Republicans and, you know, one is just as bad as the other and, and maybe racial injustice is okay in some cases. That's 
not where we're coming from. We, we are very much grounded in our understanding of the issues and we're grounded in a sense of pushing for justice for the for our communities. And that's what our journalism is for. And by not doing that, see, I want y'all to understand, and my audience knows what I'm about to say. Mm-hmm. <laughs> These other mainstream outlets, it's about marketing. Yeah. So let me try to pick off as much of the Trump or Fox News audience as I can by mm-hmm. presenting a false equivalency. Yep. Or both sides is. So on so on prison folks, y'all not gonna read manufacture stories about dissent in the first black woman vice president's office. Mm-hmm. You follow mm-hmm. what I'm saying? So so yeah. the other outlets are doing, they got to create drama and things. Yeah, and, that's and, not and, what we're here for. Yeah, that's not. And, but that said, so that's important. That in and of speaking, it's going back to freedom. Mm-hmm. That's freedom. That's true freedom of the press when you're not beholden to try to appeal to a certain audience for, for the sake of whatever, but rather you're beholden to truly objective journalism that's reporting facts and reality. That is exactly right. And I think you hit it right on the head when you said false equivalencies are what you're seeing in these other. False is the key word there. Because in order to stake out a middle position where you know maybe racism is okay, maybe it's not, we have to listen to both sides, that's a question of truth. That's not just a moral question. That's about whether or not you're reporting accurately. That's about who you're talking to, who your sources are, who's at the center of your stories. So no, what we're doing is is full and accurate reporting of, of truth that communities of color are, are living and our lived experience. And that's really kind of what animated this this piece that I wrote because it's it's that discrepancy again between the words and the lived experience and and you know Prism's aim is to come in and, and shine a light on the lived experience and and how we can fight our way to solutions to some of the issues that we're facing. It's also unfortunate in this shrinking, contracting journalism industry, mm-hmm. people participate in the false equivalency or the lack of truth and transparency because they don't want to make anybody mad. Mm-hmm. You don't know where you might have to get your next job from and you don't want to lose access. Mm-hmm. So it's better just to kind of either, you know, you know, walk very softly, not tell the truth or create a false equivalency or even give inaccurate information. Yeah. And, and so there's freedom uh, in what you are doing in terms of talking about truth, reality, real information. And I love it. So anything that's about freedom, I support. I hope all of you listeners will as well. And, and you'll see the difference when you read what they're doing. Uh, people talk about they like my show. Make, well, it's not just because I'm on here running my mouth. It's because I think you all know we're talking about things that other people want to assert their other freedom to talk about. We're going to call it like it is. And 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 we, we don't have to make anything up. This is what it is. You heard what Ashton said. It's, it, that's not even a question of opinion. If something is racist, it is racist. That's right. It is not, well, maybe this person thinks it's racist and it really isn't. You know, we, we have to call it what it is, and it can't have that ambiguity. Um, and I appreciate the position uh, that PRISM is taking and the work that PRISM is doing. Folks, we invite you to go to prismreports.org. Keep up with everything. These are women of color. And it seems like somebody says this is, uh, this is the time of women. This is the moment of women. It is. So, uh, so uh, I don't, I'm not fighting it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no point in fighting it. it. No I point in fighting it. it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> So Ashton Lattimore, the editor in chief, we look forward to uh, hearing more from Prism and talking to you more often as well. You working on anything else right now? Anything coming up we should be on lookout for? Well, let's see what we have coming up. We've been um, rolling out our series on refugee resettlement in the United States. So if you are interested in immigration coverage and particularly how communities of color are helping integrate refugees into the United States, you can come follow us on that. And we've also been doing a lot of really fantastic education coverage about the racial reckoning in education and how it's been showing up in schools this past year. So I encourage folks to come to our website and and check out our our education series that we've just rolled out uh, in time for the end of the school year. Folks, PRISM reports, P-R-I-S-M, PRISM reports.org. Be sure to check it out. Ashton Lattimore, who is the other chief has been our guest. Thank you, Ashton. Thank you, Mark. Hopefully we'll be talking more and more, okay? I hope so. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks for getting woke and listening to Make It Plain. Please remember to listen, like, and wherever you get your podcasts, please give the show a five-star rating. And please do spread the word. Let's all continue to pray for each other during this pandemic and this police-demic. If all hearts and minds are clear, it has been made plain.